Honestly, when it comes to paper clutter, there is nothing in my life that has caused me more grief or anxiety. I have gotten through it and over the past decade, I have learned some just life changing tips and principles that help me stay on top of it and that have really helped me eliminate that source of worry and frustration in my life and um, I can now sleep at night. <laughs> Well, hello everyone. Welcome to my channel. I am so glad that you stopped by today. If you're new here, my name is Natalie and I love making videos about simple, intentional living. My life as a mom and that minimalism doesn't have to be scary. When we're talking about scary, paper clutter is the pinnacle of that to me. Like I said, there is no greater source of anxiety in my life than what paper clutter used to be, whether it was bills, taxes, junk mail, uh, kids' art projects. I'm covering it all today, as well as um, giving you like the much requested tour of how I organize, and store, file, and deal with the different paper clutter in our home, and it's a lot simpler than you might think. So I hope you enjoy this video. It's actually part of the Clutter Free January Challenge collab that I've been participating in this whole month. This week's Clutter Free January playlist is linked in the description box. Be sure to tell the other creators hello, and welcome if you are new to my channel. Leave this emoji in the comments so that I can say hello to you. We've covered kitchens, closets and wardrobes, now we're tackling paper clutter, and for me, this is a biggie. So I hope you enjoy some vulnerability. I'm going to be sharing with you a very personal story about my experience with paper clutter early on, and I'm sharing with you the things that have helped me so much get over this hurdle and really keep the paper clutter to a minimum in my house. Okay, so I am going to share with you these tips in the order that I learned them. So you can kind of see this progression that I took over the last several years. The first thing that I learned, um, and it took me a few years to learn it just because of the era, but also I just, it hadn't occurred to me. It was to go digital. Now, this has been said so many times before, and if you watch other paper clutter videos, especially by minimalists, um, one of the first tips is always go digital, you know, go paperless, eliminate the bank statements, mortgage statements, magazines, uh, bills, you can go paperless with your billing. So it's all been said before, I'm not gonna spend too long here, but I think that it is one of the most important things that we can do just to, eliminate the number of things entering our house. We can't prevent every stick of junk mail arriving, um, but something that we can control is our bank statements, our mortgage statements, uh, bills, and stuff like that. I even go paperless for things like um, coupons. I don't even look at these uh, weekly flyers, especially during the whole pandemic situation. We hardly ever go into grocery stores anymore. We do grocery delivery or we'll go up and pick up a grocery order. Mostly I order through Kroger. Um, all of those digital coupons that they send in these flyers are right there in the app. So these go straight to the recycling bin, but going digital is absolutely something that anyone can do. And it really, really helps keep track and also eliminate the stuff that's coming into your house on a weekly basis. The next thing that I learned about paper clutter that not only helped the flow and like the process of getting through the paper clutter, but also just how my house looked was knowing where to put paper and where not to put paper. My paper life totally changed when my husband and I agreed to set the rule that paper does not belong on the kitchen table. I have it here right now for the video. I'm making an exception. Um, and it doesn't belong on the kitchen counter. There are like, no-go zones as far as paper because if we just allow paper to go any old place, we lose things, we let things pile up, we don't prioritize for things, we don't think about it, and then it starts to look like an absolute mess. 
We're risking misplacing or losing or having something that's really important get damaged if someone, you know, at the kitchen table, like one of my three kids, spills their water all over it. So there's a lot of reasons why we do not allow mail to be on our kitchen table or on our kitchen counters. Those are just a few of the reasons, but I think it's important to share with you like where I actually do keep mail and paper. So I'm gonna show you here, give you a little tour of the different categories of paper that I keep and how I store them. Because when we're talking about having homes for paper, I think if you're like me, it's helpful to actually see what that looks like in other people's lives. So here is my desk. This is where I edit all of my videos and send my emails and stuff. This is where I pay bills online that need to be paid. And I don't allow any like piles of mail or paper clutter to accumulate on here. Because honestly, I am not someone who works well with like a command center where I'll have like a few files, you know, to do, to file, action folder, that sort of thing does not work for me. Once it goes into a folder or like a compartment on my desk, I will not touch it for months later after the time has already passed or the bill has become overdue. I forget about things once they go into a folder. So using like a little uh, temporary filing method at my workstation does not work for me. It works for some people. And if it works for you, that's great. Um, but it, it just does not work for me. So what I do is I throw uh, like a very urgent piece of mail or whatever. Right now I actually have a traffic ticket that my husband got the other day. I'm going to rat him out here. It's actually the first ticket he's ever had in his life. Um, so it's okay. It happens. That needs to be paid ASAP. So it's sitting there on my desk. Once that is paid, it's going to be filed into my filing cabinet here. This top drawer, I have our more long-term uh, pieces of paper, documents, certificates, stuff like that, that I need to hold on to. This is here in the locked drawer because it has the most sensitive information in it. Um, and this is the sort of thing that should anything happen to myself or my husband, it would be really easy for us or someone else to dive in here and find what they need. I have things like our will, um, our retirement and investments. And then I have past taxes. These are like the bundles of, um, the tax documents and stuff from years past in case I, you know, get audited or need to show anything or refer back to what we have had in the past. So that is that like important long-term filing drawer. Um, and then I have the more short-term filing drawer. This is like for the yearly stuff. And because I do own a small business by being a content creator and I get paid by brands or for um, views of my videos on my channel, it's important for me to keep all of that information so that I can pay taxes on what I earn. For 2020 taxes, stuff that I am currently working on to be able to submit um, for tax season this year, um, 2020 receipts. So the paper receipts that I receive that I'm hanging on to in order to file and um, take out business expenses for deductions. You'll notice here in my filing cabinet that I have macro categories. So like really broad categories. I just have one thing for bills paid or one thing for vehicles. And this is sort of all encompassing of those smaller little subcategories that could fit into that subject. I don't follow a lot of KonMari stuff for the rest of my house, but um, she definitely gets it right when it comes to the filing. Just for my own personality, we I totally jive with the way that she views filing paper. Some people just love an extensive filing cabinet or like the, I've seen videos of the Freedom Filer where it has tons of these little categories that you cycle through year after year. If that method works for you and you've found something that works that has more smaller like micro categories, then more power to you. But the way my brain works and just knowing the flow of my life and how I stick things in filing drawers, uh, macro categories, broad categories work best for me. So there are only three possible places paper entering my house gets to end up. In the recycle bin, if it doesn't have personal information on it, through the shredder if it does, but it's not something that I need to file. And if it's something I do need to file and hang on to, right there in the file cabinet in whatever macro category it belongs in. Okay, and that brings me to tip number three. Um, the next thing that I learned on my journey toward being more minimal with paper, and it's actually a lesson that I learned in this last year, and that is to create 
paper routines. So I have routines ranging from in the moment stuff that just quickly comes up and how I deal with that to the daily mail, uh, weekly stuff that I do, monthly stuff that I do, as well as like the bigger quarterly or yearly like tax stuff that I do. When it comes to in the moment routines, like unexpected someone shows up at your door and has a flyer to hand you or um, my husband comes home with a traffic ticket, there is a decision to be made right then and there. And for me, it's like I said, not to shove it into like a little command center, a little, you know, temporary filing thing on my desk. I literally put it on top of my keyboard on my desk. I can't access my computer until I take care of that problem um, and, and, you know, process that and go through it. Um, and I rarely like if a bill comes in or if I come home from the doctor with a bill that I need to pay and I wasn't able to pay it there, then I will put it straight on my desk and that never piles up. I never allow more than two or three things on my desk um, because I have a policy, a routine of clearing off my desk every day before I start work. And so um, processing bills or random things that come in in the moment is really helpful for me to be able to maintain like the other workflow stuff that I do. Um, when it comes to like a daily routine, when the mail comes in, you've heard other people talk about this before. I will immediately grab any of those coupons, flyers, ads, junk mail, and throw it straight into the recycle bin on my way into the house. Um, and then from there, if there's a bill or an important document or something, it either goes straight into the file that it needs, or I will just put it on my desk right there and um, know that the next time I sit down to work, it has to be taken care of before I can like get into my computer. That really works for me, uh, taking care of the daily mail like literally immediately as it comes comes in prevents any mail from ever being tempted to pile up on our kitchen counters. When it comes to weekly stuff, again, all of these categories or routines, it's going to look different for everyone, but I try to go through all of my transactions. If I get any like actual paper receipts that I need to file, that's what you saw in that drawer of like my 2020 receipts. I just started a new 2021 folder of receipts because this time next year, I'm going to be going through all of that again <laughs> to file taxes. I think this year I'm actually going to do quarterly taxes, but that's another subject for another time. And then of course there's the monthly things um, that come in like monthly bills and, and budgets and um, putting all of that together. So usually when I'm staying on top of like the in the moment stuff as it comes in, daily mail as it comes in, and then those weekly tasks, the monthly, quarterly, and yearly tasks all really seem to fall into place much easier. So it's in the little moments, kind of like what James Clear says in his book, Atomic Habits. It's the small habits, the small routines, the in the moment decisions that really can impact years of your life. Here's a little story time. I'm probably gonna make this video long by sharing this, but I think it's important just to kind of see that we're all in this together. We, we all struggle with things like this. My husband and I, we got married pretty young. We were 20. Um, I got married coming straight out of my parents' house. So I didn't live on my own as an adult before then. Um, so there was a lot for me to learn. Back then, I was scared to even walk out to the mailbox um, because I was scared of, you know, some document or some bill or some notice or something that would be in my mailbox. And so I would avoid it for days. My mail lady would get frustrated with me and she'd like throw all the mail on my doorstep. I do not recommend doing that. I was like just living in denial and I was avoiding the inevitable. Um, and then when I would have mail in my house, I would literally just put it into this cabinet that we had in our kitchen. We were renting a little house. I would literally throw the whole bundle of mail into this cabinet and it helped me hide it away. I would close the door. It was out of sight, out of mind, but not really because I was always thinking about it. It would keep me up at night. I would worry. Um, and then by some administrative miracle, my husband and I were able to buy our first house w within the first year we were married. We moved out and instead of going through each piece and recycling the things I needed to recycle, shredding the things I needed to shred, and then filing the things that I needed to file, I literally just packed all of that mail, all of those pieces of papers into boxes, labeled them office, 
they moved with us into our new house which wasn't much bigger and I ended up shoving everything back into that cabinet that we put in a different spot in our new house. Okay, that is such an embarrassing <laughs> story. <laughs> I mean, I'm laughing about it now and I feel like I'm a completely different person than I was back then. But even to this day, I still deal with fears and um, the feeling of not wanting to even walk out to my mailbox to find something. And back then, we struggled financially. There was a period of time where we were definitely living paycheck to paycheck and it was hard to make ends meet. And not only did I have to learn how to manage everything just from a clerical standpoint, but there was also a lot of heart work that went into learning to be a better steward of what God has given us. We're Christians and so we learned a lot about relying on Him to provide for us and nowadays I do have more income and I have so much more financial freedom and I'm grateful for that but I still get scared I still get nervous but I have found that just taking care of it then and there saves me so much time and headache and frustration and it allows me to sleep at night <laughs> moral of the story folks is whether you have a lot of money or whether you are living paycheck to paycheck staying on top of your paper clutter and the mail that you get is absolutely important it doesn't matter what stage of life you are in or how much money you have in the bank right now taking care of things asap makes a huge difference not just financially not just credit wise but also for your mental and emotional health. So that is how I deal with the paper clutter for me, for my business, for our household. Um, but now I just have a couple of things to share with you as far as kids paper, because this is an area for many people that causes so much frustration and also a bit of anxiety because we kind of dive into the sentimental portion of the paper in our lives when we're talking about art projects, school little papers that they colored and brought home. I'm gonna set you on top of this jar of jelly beans. We use jelly beans in our house as like a little reward system for our kids. It works really well. Um, so there's a little bonus tip for you. Um, but when it comes to kids paper clutter, the number one tip that I have is actually a mindset shift. It's a kind of a different way of thinking about it. And it's for you as well as for your kids so you can like set the good example you can um, lead by example when it comes to this and that is that coloring is a verb i think a lot of us see coloring a coloring as a person place or thing a noun um we see the little projects this is from sunday school for my kids um, one of my kids uh drew uh, four people our family we have five people in our family. I don't know what this is. It's adorable. <laughs> I do know that. Um, and then I have little scrippy scrappy paper where, I mean, do your kids do this? Do they draw one weird <laughs> random thing? A circle. It's, it's just a circle <laughs> on a piece of paper. Um, and then these start to pile up. They really do. But we see coloring as a thing, as a finished product. But in fact, coloring, or you can uh, swap that out with drawing, art, anything. It's the act of drawing. It's the act of coloring. It's the process. It's the fun that we have with this activity of being creative. And that is the purpose that coloring or whatever holds in our life. While this is cute and sweet and I do feel a bit of sentiment toward it, I have to reframe my thinking around it to see the picture as a snapshot of a time that they spent being creative. Um, and so that makes it easier. And all of that to say, that concept, that mindset shift makes it easier for me to part with the plethora of this sort of thing in my house and not feel guilty about it. They created this, I think it's a chicken. 
Um, we laughed about it. We talked about um, what they used to create it. Did you use glue? Is there tape on this? And I, I bring them back through the process that they went through to create the item to sort of like subconsciously plant the seed that this isn't about what we can hold in the end. It's about the experience that we had creating it. When it fulfills the purpose, that it was intended to, which is to give them an activity, to give them something to do, to help them um, exercise their creativity, then once it's fulfilled that purpose, we no longer really need it. However, we will get to a certain point in the, all of the creativity that they have where we do want to hold on to things and we do choose to keep things. And this is how we go about doing that. We let our kids choose what they want to keep as long as it fits into this space. And this is something that I have to credit Dana K. White from A Slob Comes Clean in her book, uh, Decluttering at the Speed of Life. I found it especially helpful with kids' art projects. You got to let the boundary or the box or the container be the bad guy. And for us, it is this little space here in our paper organizer. On the top here, I have blank copier paper. And this little space under here is where we are keeping the things that they are um, currently attached to. We cycle through this and then like the very best of the best ends up going into little memory boxes for them, which I'm going to get to sentimental items in next week's video. And I'm going to dive into that a little bit more detailed. Um, but for now, just suffice it to say, if there's something in here that they absolutely want to keep, like Mr. Chicken with the green star belly button, then if they choose to put it in their memory box, it goes in there. But most of the time, they're actually pretty reasonable and they'll be like, oh, no, I don't need need Mr. Green Star Belly Button Chicken. This one's gonna be for um, keep. This one's gonna so if you are thinking about implementing this sort of system, like the container method with your kids, please don't expect that the first time you go through this and make those hard decisions with your kids and go through the process of letting the boundary be the bad guy, that it's going to go as smooth as it looks like it goes for me. When we first started doing this, it was more difficult for them to part with the things that they loved. They would be attached to every little scrap of paper and now it is relatively easy and sometimes they just do it on their own. I just want to give that encouragement to you guys if this is something that you're going to start to implement to just give it time and ha be patient with it and set that good example of not being too emotionally attached to things and, and helping your kids through that process. This is where we keep their coloring books. We swap these out periodically. Uh, best place to find coloring books, by the way, is the thrift store. They're like 10 cents each. Yes, I call this my artsy fartsy bin. Um, and if you keep things lighthearted and you just lead by example, like I said, then um, it doesn't have to be so scary when it comes time to part with things. So I like the idea of coloring books to let them be creative because it kind of instills that idea that we're practicing, we're having fun, this is an activity. Kind of like what we do in this drawer, we have um, like dry erase supplies. I have some dry erase pens, these little activity slips. The kids love doing dry erase and they know like there's no tears when it's time to erase them because that's just kind of the system, that's how it works. And that's another one of those activities that doesn't take up very much space but still gives them that creative sort of artistic playtime. I have um, these drawers here in this cube unit. They have a variety of different things in them. I've shown this in like homeschool room tours before. I'll link those in the description box if you guys are curious, like this whole unit here and what I have. Um, it's a little different. I continually try to improve things, but I'm just gonna show you like stuff that pertains to paper. Um, so these are my two drawers. I just have like pens, pencils, rulers, tape, that sort of thing. Um, um, as well as stickers and stationery stamps. If I'm gonna send a card to a friend, that's where I keep this stuff. Uh, we have Play-Doh in that drawer, that doesn't matter. This is where my kids' curriculum is, um, like their school books and stuff for our homeschooling time. We have big um, like curriculum compiled books here and then smaller reference books. Um, and then I just have them in these little hanging files by macro categories, because that doesn't help just me. It also helps my kids to not have things to um, 
intricately or specifically um, organized. Uh, this drawer has the dry erase like I was showing you and then we have box sets, learning to read, their Osmo little set for their uh, tablet which we love by the way, update on that system, we love it. And then we have a little scripture memory card boxed set as well. We also have some like craft supplies in there which I want to refine the way I store and organize craft supplies but that's another video for another time. Today it was all about the paper clutter in our house. And I hope that this video was encouraging and that if nothing else, you saw that you're not alone when it comes to not just the frustration, but also the fear when it comes to paper clutter. The anxiety surrounding paper clutter is uh, rarely addressed. And so I wanted to be that for you guys. If you were looking for some support in that area, you are not alone if you feel overwhelmed by the paper. And like I was saying earlier, if you just work on it day after day, a little bit at a time, it gets easier and you do yourself such a favor, such a service for the future when you stay on top of things, whether it's scarier things like bills and taxes or not so scary things. I mean, I don't know. I think he's actually pretty scary, honestly. But when you get into things that are sentimental, like kids artwork or whatever, we, we have a lot of fear surrounding sentimental stuff as well. And so this is an area of my life that has improved so much, but I definitely was in like a pretty dark place when it comes to how I viewed the paper clutter in my life. And I have been so empowered. I have overcome this hurdle, but only through the, like, the daily discipline and through really just getting real with myself and not living in denial anymore of the things that were coming in to my house, the bills that needed to be paid, as well as um, how sentimental I can be about certain things like kids artwork and stuff like that. So more on the sentimental stuff in next week's video. We're gonna be working in the garage on some of our storage spaces and solutions. I'm gonna be sharing some tips with you guys and then also diving into this whole topic of sentimental items and how I approach sentimental items. So more on that next week. I know we kind of got into it a little bit in this video, but that is everything that I have to share with you in today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. Give it a thumbs up if you did. Be sure to go watch the other YouTubers in this clutter-free January collab. The playlist, again, it's linked in the description box so you can go get some more inspiration and motivation. If you're a micro organizer, you might like some of the videos in this collab because we're all different. We're all sharing just from our own points of view, which I love so, so much. So go tell those other creators hello. Tell them that Natalie sent you. And if you're new here, then I'm so glad that you stopped by. I'd love it so much if you would subscribe and turn that bell button on so you don't miss future videos from me. I hope you're having a wonderful day wherever you are. Thank you so much for spending a little Little part of your day here with me on my channel and I'll catch you later. Your rules don't apply to me, no. I blow away all the pressure.